It's on, Philip. Is it okay? It's on, yeah. Right. right. Let us pray. Help us now, Lord, that above every other voice, above everything that is crying out within us, help us above it all to hear your voice, the voice of the living God, the voice of our Father who loves us, the voice of our Saviour who is gracious to us, the voice of the Spirit who enters into fellowship with us. Gracious God, may we hear your voice now speaking deeply into our hearts. We ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, now, we can't avoid the fact that we are meeting together today as a church under a very dark cloud of providence. We don't want to avoid the fact. Uh, we, of all people, should not want to avoid the fact of what's happened, uh, the sudden and tragic death of our dear brother, Donald. Uh, we can't, well, we might be able to begin to imagine what Sean and the girls must be going through at this moment. And I'm sure many have assured them that our prayers are with them. I was praying and preparing yesterday and uh, I said to the Saviour, Lord Jesus, I wish you could do this <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, I, 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 you'd get it so right. Uh, you'd speak so wisely. Uh, you'd speak so honestly, and yet you'd speak so sensitively, uh, so tenderly, so compassionately. Oh, I, I wish you could do it. <laughs> uh, the prophet said of you that you have the tongue of the learned, and you know how to speak a word in season to those who are weary, uh, and so I wish you could do it. But he said to me, well, but by my spirit, I will be doing it. <laughs> uh, I am with you, and you have my word, and I've given you the wisdom of my word, and I've promised you the help of the Holy Spirit. So I will be with you. And so my prayer is that I might follow my Saviour and speak wisely, speak honestly, speak sensitively, and speak compassionately. And so from the passage that was read to us by Ewan, uh, I, I want to speak of three providences, particularly from the part where uh, some who claim to be disciples, and that was interesting, and we, we'll see that in a little while, a bit further. Um, this is a hard saying, they said, uh, and so from that point on down to where Peter says, uh, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So from that passage, uh, I, I want to speak of a hard providence, what Cowper in his hymn called a frowning providence. 
And then I want to speak about a searching providence. And then I want to speak about it all leading to a glorious providence. So first of all, I want to speak about a hard, a frowning providence. Providence is God's sovereign control over all things, the whole universe, all the events of life and circumstances and death. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. And these people at this time, by God's providence, they are where they are, listening to the Lord Jesus, listening to his words. Uh, and of course, the problem is uh, they get it all wrong. Uh, and so what is really, in essence, a smiling providence, because they have the Savior giving them wonderful teaching. Uh, but they get it all wrong and they turn it into something hard and difficult. This is a hard saying, uh, they say. And, and I want us uh, to think about that just for a moment, to just to show how uh, they so dishonored the Savior and what kind of Savior he is in a situation like we are passing through as a church at the moment and Sean and the family are passing through. This is a hard saying, these people said to the Lord Jesus. And the word hard means stern, harsh. One commentator even said it, it even has a hint of being inhuman. So imagine that these people could be listening to our Savior and describing his teaching as harsh stern, even inhuman. And, and the Lord Jesus, reading their hearts and their minds, he says to them, are, are you offended by this? Uh, and uh, that word offended, it, it means many things, but I, I just want to take up the fact uh, that from the Greek word offended, we get the word scandal, scandalize. And these people were scandalized by the Lord Jesus. Is this a scandal to you? Uh, are you, are you scandalized by, by what I'm saying? I who am the bread of life, I've come down from heaven for you. And you consider me harsh and stern and inhuman. And you were scandalized by me. How could that be? How could we ever think such things of the Savior? How could we ever think that he would be stern or harsh? The one uh, who, of whom the prophet said, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. The one who ever only only spoke truth in love, the one who is the most human person that's ever walked the face of this earth, true humanity is in the Lord Jesus. How could they ever think that he would be inhuman? How amazing. And so well, we want to nail their lies and tell them you've got it all wrong. These are not hard sayings. These are not sayings to be scandalized by. Uh, these are the sayings of our Savior, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, and so uh, they turn a smiling providence into a frowning providence. But of course, we have to acknowledge that in the scripture, there are hard providences. There are 
frowning providences and we we can't water that down we can't pretend otherwise in donald's sudden and tragic death we are facing a hard providence a frowning providence what do we say to this how do we understand it how do we explain it well first of all we have to be truthful we have to be honest we have to say lord we are finding this hard we are finding this difficult it's hard lord but it's a hard providence it's a providence what happened to donald was not a chance happening it was not a dreadful mistake it was not a chaotic event it was a statement of the press and when they expressed their deep grief and their sense of an irreplaceable loss they could still say not we grieve they said to the press but not without hope because you see they believe it's a providence or they could never we'll see much else as well but at this point i want to impress upon you that we are not dealing with something accidental great providence of heaven what wonder shine in its profound display of god's design it guards the dust of earth fulfills commands the hosts above fulfills the mighty plan of his great love its radiance dense is but a it's its darkness dense is but a radiant light its off perplexing paths are ordered right soon the winding paths will end and then the tale of wonder will be told beyond the veil it's a providence god is in control he's never been out of control my mind went uh, to a letter written by cs lewis to a young husband whose wife had tragically died he's only been married a few years and and cs lewis wrote to the husband and the husband took up a, a quote in cs lewis's letter and he wrote a book about his experience and he included the quote in the title and of course uh, the, the the title was a severe mercy a severe mercy uh, lewis wrote you have been treated with a severe mercy what had happened to him was severe what has happened to shan and the family is severe and we don't water that down it would be disrespectful to them to suggest otherwise but they've said it's a mercy as well it's a severe mercy we grieve but not without hope where's the mercy in this event well donald is with the lord he's with christ he's gone home he's safe it's a mercy imagine if they didn't have that hope imagine if they had the knock on the door your husband's been tragically killed and they believe that's the end he's gone he is no more that's the end of it oh dear how dark how dreadful that would be but we are not without hope they said it's a mercy he's with god he's with his savior whom he loved and lived for for so many years 
but Sean, now you have to face life alone without Donald. Yes, that's severe, but it's a mercy because I have one who said to me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you every step of the way. My grace is sufficient for you. What if like so many in this situation who face these events and they have no savior and they're alone and there's nothing and there's no one uh, and, and they have to walk this way all on their own. But Sean is not in that place. It's a mercy. She has a savior and he's with her and he'll uphold her and underneath her will be the everlasting arms. Oh, it's hard, it's severe, but it's a providence, it's a mercy, because God will never leave them, nor forsake them. So we have to face that. It's real, it's hard. But then it's a searching mercy, isn't it? It searches us. And we have to be honest about this. Think of the words of the Lord Jesus in verse 64. Yet some of you do not believe. They said they believed. They said they were disciples. But Jesus, we read, that some do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning them, from the beginning, which of them did not believe. The, the, these, some of the listening crowd who are scandalized, who see it as hard, uh, they like the ones in the parable of the sower, they, they, they seem to believe, but when the hard times came, when the hard word came, then what happened to them? They were off. They were gone. They didn't, they didn't want to know. It searched them and it found them wanting and they were away. And so now the Lord Jesus brings the searching question to the true disciples, to the real disciples. Do you want to go away as well? Do you want to go? And that word want, as it's translated in some of our, uh, will you go away in others? Uh, the, the, the word is a Greek word meaning desire. And, and Jesus is challenging his disciples. He's putting them on the spot at this point. Will you go away? What's your desire at this point? What is your heart at this matter? Some have heard me and said, oh, he's hard. He's inhuman. Some have heard me and be scandalized. What about you? What is your desire? Do you want to leave me as well? He says. Now, that's a, a, a searching question to true believers. That's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians when he spoke of great testings. And he said to them, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we are stirred through this incident. How are we going to react? What are our desires in this situation? What is, what is our heart? Whenever I've preached on Job and spoken about his wife, I've only ever spoken of her in contrast to Job. Of Job, it was said, in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong, in spite of everything that had happened. He did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. His wife, 
she says to him, do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. Only this time I'm suddenly brought up short. And I'm searched. I say to myself, stop for a moment. Put yourself in the shoes of Job's wife. She'd carried in her womb ten children. She'd given birth to ten children. She'd nurtured ten children. And suddenly, in one tragic accident, they're all gone. Which of us, which of you, would I, would throw the first stone at Job's wife when she says, do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, dear me, Lord, I humble myself before you. You search me. Do I want to go away? Is that my desire? When the hard times come to me, when the trials come to me, do I want to doubt you? Do I want to think ill of you? Do I want to speak against you? Do I want to challenge your goodness, your justice, your fairness? What's my desire in this? It's a searching providence. Well, as we reflect on these dreadful events, may we hear the searching question of our Saviour as he says to us, will you go? Or will you remain faithful and true? Will you go on to say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? So, dear brothers and sisters, these providences, these hard providences, they are searching providences. How will we handle them? How will we react to them? Oh, Lord, give us grace. Help us to take heed lest we stumble, lest we fall. But then all of this leads to a glorious providence because it produces the most glorious reply, doesn't it? Peter, typical of Peter, in first, but he's horrified. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else is there? Who else is there, Lord? He, he wants to know. Any volunteers? Lord, any suggestions? Uh, can you point us in any other direction? To whom, Lord? If not you, then tell us to whom. And, uh, well, Lord, uh, well, would you send me to, would you send me to the new atheists lord perhaps they can help me in this situation well i'd only recently read a, a familiar quote but it was quoted at length uh, by the brother who spoke the other saturday evening and he's written an article in the banner of truth magazine about hope in death and he quotes the most famous of the new atheists and his most famous statement. And it says this, in a universe of selfish genes, blind physical forces, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. 
the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing, but pitiless indifference, Lord, shall I go to him? Lord, what can he do for me? What can he say to me? He goes on to say, we are going to die. That makes us the lucky ones. We privileged few. We who won the lottery of birth against all odds. How dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Oh, what bold words, what courageous words. Dear man, go and knock Shan's door and say to her, how dare you whine? How dare you whine? Gordon's the lucky one. He's dead. Oh, dear Lord. Shall I go to him? Shall I go to him? What can he say to me? What can he do for me in this situation? Perhaps I'll go to an old atheist. I'll go to the German Nietzsche and his famous statement. God is dead. But given the way of men, there may be still be caves where for thousands of years his shadow will be shown. And we, we still have to vanquish his shadow too. We must get rid even the shadow of God. He's dead. Nihilism, he cried. Nothingness, meaninglessness, eternally. Oh, thank you. I'm not going to you. I'm not going to you. To whom shall we go? Lord Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. You can speak into this situation. You can bring hope into this situation. Eternal life. And in John's gospel, of course, eternal life is not only the promise of something future, but in John's gospel, eternal life is the possession of something present. Jesus said, I give to my sheep eternal life. I give it to them now. It's theirs. It's their possession now. Or in, in John uh, chapter 5 and in verse 24, the Lord Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He has it. It's his present possession the Lord Jesus says and will not be condemned he has crossed over from death to life what words we have as a present possession present pardon present peace present plenty he's the bread of life he that eats of me shall never hunger he that drinks of me shall never thirst those are present realities from our saviour eternal life here and now I had a dear brother in our church Cumbran, and he always prayed lord show us heaven on the way to heaven and i love that prayer because we have heaven on the way to heaven it's a present possession eternal life i give to my sheep eternal life and so peter says you have the words now i don't want to push this too far but um, it just struck me that, that those who said this is a hard saying literally this is a hard word in the singular 
It's as if they reduced everything that she, the, they want to cut down to size. They want to diminish the wonderful things that Jesus has said because they've been offended by it. And, and, and they reduce it. This is a hard word. That's all it is. Just a word. But Peter says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. There aren't enough words to speak what you speak. There aren't enough words to declare what you declare uh, in this eternal life. And oh, dear me, we could roam John's gospel. I haven't time to do that. But he, just from chapter six, uh, just to illustrate this, uh, I, I just want to pick up the one verse in verse um, 39, where uh, the Savior says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. I will lose none of all that you have given me, and I will raise them up at the last day. What words, what immensities, what infinities are in those words. Of all you've given me, I have lost none. Sean, free school court, God did not lose Donald. God did not let go of Donald. Donald was in the Savior's hand every moment, from the moment he was struck till the moment he landed in heaven. He was never out of the Lord's hand. The Lord had not let go of him. The Lord had lo lost him. Of all whom you've given me, I have lost none, not Donald Mitchell. He was in my hand. I was with him through it all. Well then, Lord, why such a cruel death? Oh, the Savior would say, I know all about cruel deaths. I know all about cruel deaths. I've been through a cruel death. There was no, no death more, no, no more cruel than mine. And I went through a cruel death for you, for you a sin, for you a salvation. And I flew through that death with Donald and I was with him and I didn't let him go and I didn't lose him. And I haven't lost him. He's with me. He's here. Look at him. Look at him, he's rejoicing with me. I haven't lost him, I never will lose him. How glorious, how glorious is this? It's about it, of course there is. But we don't understand, of course there is. And our Saviour says to us, now you know in part, now you understand in part. Am I big enough for you to trust me with what you don't understand? Am I big enough in your eyes for you to trust me when there is no present explanation for this hard providence that we are passing through? Trust me, I haven't lost him. And I lose none whom the Father has given me. My mind went. Uh, I thought of something I sang at the funeral of a very dear friend some years ago. And I, I wanted to find the brochure. I wanted to find the leaflet. 
Uh, and I found it yesterday, of course, because I only just knew that I would be speaking this morning. But something from that funeral came back to me. Lord Jesus, you have the words. It's you. It's you we need. It's you, Lord Jesus. And I travelled to Yorkshire. And I found out the leaflet and I discovered it was on December the 19th. <laughs> and yesterday was December the 19th. And on December the 19th, 2009, I travelled to Yorkshire to the funeral of a very dear friend. I'd married her to her husband many years ago. And she was only 56 now and she died after a long struggle with cancer. And oh, she was such a sweet, delightful believer. Uh, and, and this is what she wanted us to, to sing as we were assembling at the beginning of the service. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can all this world. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. When I come to die, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. What a glorious providence. What a glorious saviour. Oh, so many hymns come to mind. Give me Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, all sufficient, beyond telling is thy worth. It's gone. Greater treasures than the richest found on earth. Such abundance, such abundance is my portion with my God. Give me Jesus. My heart has found the pearl of great price. I found the pearl of greatest price. My heart will sing for joy. I have a friend, oh, such a friend, who loved me ere I knew him. He drew me with a cord of love, and thus he bound me to him. Give me Jesus. Life. What a glorious providence. What a glorious saviour. Finally, can you just go on to say with Peter, and Lord, there's an and now, and we believe, and we know that you are the Christ, the Son of God. We know it, Lord. We believe it, Lord. So, all who are listening, believers, rejoice that you know it and believe it. And in the morning when you rise, pray, give me Jesus. And when you are alone, pray, give me Jesus. And when you come to die, pray, give me Jesus. And now in this situation, Lord, give us Jesus. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, come to him, pray to God, God, give me Jesus, I need him, and I need him now, so that I might be able to say, I know, and I believe that Jesus is the one, and I trust him, and I give myself And it's a searching providence. 
but it leads us to a glorious providence because it leads us to Jesus and to him be the glory. Amen.